Hello everyone, welcome back to our podcast. I'm Kirtana. Uh, and I'm Zian. And I'm Divya. So today, we'll be discussing something that is important to know and understand, especially for us veterinary students, which is about complications in pregnancy, specifically in ruminants. So we'll be focusing on few complications such as pseudo-pregnancy, wandering, ectopic pregnancy, hydramnios, as well as abortion. Thank you, Kitana. So guys, I think I'll start first on pseudo-pregnancy. Okay, the definition and characteristic of pseudo-pregnancy are is a false pregnancy whereby the animal shows symptoms of pregnancy although they are not physically carrying a fetus. The causes of pseudo-pregnancy is failure of luteal regression, whether in non-mated cycling animals or in mated animals, affected by embryonic or fetal death, can occur spontaneously in unmated animals even during the non-breeding season. The clinical symptoms are the pseudo-pregnancy is hydrometra, which is fluid buildup in the uterus. It arises as a result of extended and continuous progesterone exposure from the corpus luteum. Pseudo-pregnancy can last for several months if not identified and the amount of fluid can reach several liters. In such circumstances, the swollen aband- abdo- sorry, abdomen will give the erroneous impression that the animal is pregnant. Other enlargement may also occur. Zian, would you like to explain more on the treatment? Yeah, thank you, Manisha. Sure, I will talk about uh, how to manage and treat a pseudo-pregnancy. So usually treatment is uh, followed with a limb luteolytic dosage of uh, PGF-F2-alpha, so also known as prostaglandin F2-alpha. So this uh, uh, dosage will promote a uh, luteal regression and also a uh, uterine fluid discharge within uh, the first or second, uh, within one or two days. So uh, in, some, in certain cases, uh, second injection is also required so to induce a total fluid uh, evacuation from the uterus. Wow, what happens if the dough is treated during the breeding season? Oh, so if let's say uh, dough is treated during breeding se- uh, season, uh, the animal will enter uterus uh, within two to three days and can be mated or uh, inseminated. So uh, like I said before, if let's say a second injection uh, usually is required when uh, it wants to completely empty the uterus. So pseudo-pregnancy can also end on its own when there are progesterone production uh, by the corpus luteum uh, cases, a cyst, when the, uh, when the corpus uh, luteum cyst. So as a result, the cervix will start to relax and uterine contractility is stimulated. So this will follow by uterine fluid discharge. So uh, the latter technique is sometimes known as a cloud burst. So after efficient treatment uh, with prostaglandin f uh, the fertility will... Uh, Significant, significantly increase to approach an acceptable level. So therefore, the culling of affected goods is often not recommended immediately uh, after diagnosis. I see. Mm, thank you, Divya and Zian. That was really interesting. Um, so now I think I'll explain a bit on another complication called wandering. Wandering? Does it have the same meaning as the English word? Um, the answer is No as this wandering is actually spelled with an A instead of an O, and it is also known as wandering of ovum or wandering of embryo, is actually basically a situation where the corpus luteum gravidatitum or CLG is present only in one ovary, but the embryo or fetus is found in the uterine uh, cornua and it is contralateral or opposite to the corpus luteum gravidi tatum or CLG. And this is actually a very rare situation as studies show that only 1.5 to 2% have occurred in cattle. Hmm. Only 1.5 to 2%. That's very low. So what exactly that causes this uh, very rare situation? 
Yeah, Zian, there are actually a few causes uh, such as migration of oom via transperitoneal, migration of embryo via transuterine, and even due to the original corpus luteum gravidatum or CLG regressing, and then the mature follicle eventually ruptures, and the second corpus luteum gravidatum will start to develop. Hey, Divya, we presented about ectopic pregnancy last week in class, right? Maybe you'd like to share some information on that first to our podcast listeners? Yes, I've been waiting to share actually. So the definition of ectopic pregnancy is the implantation and subsequent embryonic development of an embryo in a site other than the uterus. The ovary, the uterine tube and peritoneal cavity are all the potential site for embryonic implantation. Ectopic pregnancy, which occurs most commonly in human rather than domestic animal, is usually result in the death of embryo or fetus, as well as serious maternal bleeding and in extreme cases, death. Any pregnancy that happens when the embryo implants in location other than the cavum uterine, it frequently results in a mother's death, particularly during the first trimester, and most of them does not develop until birth. I see. Thanks, Sylvia. So guys, there are actually two types of ectopic pregnancy that occurs in ruminants, namely graviditas abdominalis and graviditas uh, tuberalis. So graviditas abdominalis is when the fertilized egg develops in the abdominal cavity, like the name uh, abdominalis, and this is actually further divided into graviditas abdominalis primer and graviditas abdominalis, uh, abdominalis uh, secundum. Graviditas abdominal primer is when the fertilized egg is developed in the abdominal cavity from the beginning itself. While for graviditas abdominal secondary is the fertilized egg firstly developed in the uterus, then it developed in the abdominal region. Yes, Tivia. And on the other hand, graviditas tuberalis is a pregnancy in which the egg is fertilized in the fallopian tube, but the pregnancy does not continue in the uterine cavity. Oh, so for this condition, I've actually read uh, about the causes and of uh, this uh, condition. So um, usually it's due to an impaired anatomy and physiological function of the fallopian tube and the uterine. So usually fallopian tube uh, is the, the damage that of the fallopian tube that will cause ovum transfer to be restricted. So this uh, fallopian tube damage is usually uh, a result of maybe abdominal surgery, also like uh, infection of the pel pelvis post-surgery. So one of the causative agents uh, such as uh, chlamydia species uh, and also other conditions like chronic uh, salpingitis which is also the mild salping injury cases uh, causes the tuber or cilia to uh, reduce or even uh, cilia loss. Another uh, cause will be like a peritubal adhesion. This is where condition where the endosalpics is destroyed and also causing the cilia to reduce or even diminish. So other general uh, reason that causes uh, graviditas tuber tubarials is like old and age, as age uh, become older, this will cause the cilia motility to begin to slow down. Therefore, ovum transport is also restricted and hampered. So such as another, and also other changes like in hormone levels, or maybe like there is a long history of spontaneous abortion. These are also one of the external causes that will cause uh, gravity dust to barriers. Okay, thank you, Zian. Okay, for now, I'll be talking about the treatment for... Okay. The sole treatment of ectopic pregnancies in animals documented in literature is surgical remo removal, either with or without ovarian hysterectomy. This could be because most diagnoses are made by a chance or as a result of necropsy. There are no more therapies for animals in the consulted book. As a result, the following management approach are more towards human. There's another complication called hydro hydromyos. What is it? 
Ah, uh, yes. Hydroamnes, or also known as uh, polyhydramnes, is basically an overabundance of amniotic fluid which surrounds the fetus in the uterus. It is characterized by a gradual accumulation of amniotic fluid with a steady enlargement of abdomen in the dam. And this is evident during the last trimester. At times, we can actually misdiagnose the enlarged abdomen to be maybe like indigestion, bloating, or sometimes even traumatic gastritis. And this condition is actually caused by both fetal as well as maternal causes. So when we say fetal causes, it could be either congenital anomalies, um, uni ovular twins, as well as an increased placental mass which can all contribute to this condition. So when we say congenital anomalies, for example, anencephaly and atresia of the esophagus or duodenum, it enables the fetus to swallow the amniotic uh, liquor. And for univalvular twins, it uh, cause is due to the interconnecting of vascularity in the placenta, where one fetus it gets more circulation so that its heart and kidneys hypertrophies, which leads to an increased urine production. So only one amniotic sac is actually affected. Oh, I see. How about the maternal causes? Mm, um, for maternal causes uh, such as diabetes mellitus, uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and also severe uh, generalized edema, these conditions can contribute to hydramion. So pregnancy-induced hypertension uh, is due to edema of the placenta. So uh, whereas diabetes mellitus, so this occurs uh, is due to an increased osmotic pressure of the liquor and me. So usually this condition is caused by a high sugar content and as, as well as due to the fetal polyuria. So uh, fetal polyuria will, uh, is resulting from uh, hyperglycemia. So some clinical symptoms of uh, this uh, hydramnion is like uh, severe dyspnea and also edema. So uh, if this uh, situation is very severe, so usually uh, treatment will be the dilation of cervix uh, followed by assisted delivery providing gentle traction. So as well as uh, provision of intravenous fluid administration. So these are the steps that uh, can prevent uh, a condition called hypovolemic shock. So uh, it's usually associated with splenic pooling of uh, blood. How do we diagnose it? Can we use rectal palpation? Uh, if let's say we use rectal palpation, uh, it's not to know, but it's a very, very hard process at, uh, as the uterus will be very tense. So rectal palpation usually is not recommended. Yeah. So um, I was thinking about abortion, uh, this case. So uh, can Kitana, can you explain like, more into details about abortion, this condition? Um, yes, sure, Zian. So abortion actually occurs when a pregnancy is terminated after organogenesis is complete, but before the ejected fetus has even a chance to leave. So it is actually commonly characterized in cows as pregnancy loss, and it costs, uh, it occurs usually between 42 and 260 days of the gestation period. Ah, I see. So um, I've always wondered about this condition abortion is very bad. So may I know like what are the causes that will cause abortion to occur? Yeah, there's actually a um, few causes, you know, uh, for example, um, you have uh, both infectious and non-infectious causes. You have induced or spent, uh, spontaneous reasons as well. So if we say uh, non-infectious causes, it's actually more prevalent in cattle as compared to sheep and horses. And uh, examples are usually due to genetic factors, heat stress and toxins. So for heat stress, it may cause fetal hypotension, hypoxia and uh, acidosis, whereas toxins such as sodium iodide, mycotoxins, nitrates, and nitrites may contribute to abortion as well. And for infectious causes, um, for example, leptospirosis, brucellosis, 
um, chlamydiosis and even infectious bovine rhinotracheitis or IBR and um, even uh, bovine viral diarrhea, BVD and more. And for induced abortion, it can it is usually done by giving a high doses of estrogen, uh, progest uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha and glucocorticoids, particularly in uh, young females that are bred at an early age and in meat producing uh, animals. Mm, I see. Then what about the symptoms of like what do you know when abortion occurs and how do we prevent situations from this uh, to happen? Okay, since there are various reasons that causes abortion, therefore there will be a lot of clinical symptoms for it. For example, a bacterial infection such as brucellosis, abortion occurs typically during the third trimester and the cryon placenta will have pathological changes like necrosis and oedema. Placenta retention may lead to in infection and even death to the animal. I see. Actually, yeah, I've actually read something about this. And unfortunately, brucellosis can't be treated and they can only be prevented through vaccination programs, uh, specifically the Brucella strain 19 vaccine. They are injected on uh, in cows between the months of three to seven. And if the vaccine is administered while the calf is more than eight months old, it will actually cause low immunity. And for adult cattle, the Brucella strain 45 uh, stroke 20 vaccine is used. And um, a quarantine period of four weeks is required post-vaccination. And apart from that, for protozoan infection, one of the examples would be trichomoniasis. And these infected animals usually will show vulvovaginitis and cervicitis. And this will lead to, unfortunately, lead to abortion during the first trimester and followed by pyometra as well. And this condition is usually treated by administering uh, estrogen as well as antibiotics such as metronidazole and dimetriazole as well. See, uh, thank you for your uh, detailed explanation. Uh, this was a very interesting discussion. Yeah. I agree. We now have more in-depth knowledge on those complications in pregnancy. And I think this information will be so useful for us as well as our podcast listeners who will be future veterans as well. Definitely, since we also discussed some of the clinical symptoms and treatment, we can now identify them in the animals and help them out. Yeah, I think that's it for our uh, for today's podcast. Uh, I hope others will learn something from us. So please stay tuned for more interesting topics that will be discussed in the future. We hope you enjoyed and learned a lot today. I'm Kirtana. And I'm Zian. And I'm Divya. Goodbye, and we shall see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.